So now it is being recorded. <laughs> um, so welcome everybody. Let me just, oh, sorry, let me orient myself a little bit. So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Erin Foster and I am the service lead for UC Berkeley's Research Data Management Program or RDM program. The RDM program is a partnership between research IT and the library and helps researchers navigate the complex landscape of managing data before, during, and after their research. So we assist with everything from planning up front for data management, to advising around available data storage solutions, to walking through the options for data publishing and sharing that we're going to cover in this session. So I'm joined today by several colleagues, um, Anna Sackman, who is also the library's science data and engineering librarian, uh, Rachel Sandberg, who leads the office, the library's Office of Scholarly Communication Services. Um, so her office helps scholars navigate publishing, intellectual property, and information policy in their research scholarship and instruction. And finally, last but not least, uh, Tim Vollmer, the, the Scholarly Communication and Copyright Librarian in the library's Office of Scholarly Communication Services. So we're excited today to discuss strategies, law, and policy about sharing research data. So as you know, we're going to record this session um, and we're going to put it up on our YouTube site. So we'll send a link to the recording around after and also our slides and a transcript. Um, we won't though record the Q&A session, which will follow the presentation. Um, so we want to encourage free discussion in that. So feel free to put your questions in the Zoom chat throughout. Um, I'll monitor that and um, we can save them to the end or discuss them in the moment, depending. Um, we'll have plenty of time. We should have plenty of time to talk today. So as scholars or professionals who help scholars with their research, um, we all understand that data sharing is essential to a healthy research and publishing life cycle. It promotes collaboration, facilitates reproducibility, and makes you a more competitive researcher by sustaining your data's impact. So communicating with those you work with, so your research team, your collaborators, um, librarians that you're working with, about data sharing early on in the project life cycle is a critical step in research data management planning. Other decisions like selecting appropriate metadata standards, or file formats, and repositories may all hinge on the choices you make regarding when, how, and where you share your research data. And as we know, if your research data is supported by a federal agency, um, you may be required to share that data. So for instance, the National Science Foundation, NSF, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric, Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, and the National Institutes of Health, NIH, all require that data be shared to some degree or other. Um, and increasingly, journals are also requiring data sharing as part of publication, regardless of the requirements from federal agencies, um, all in order to promote research reproducibility and pr prompt um, follow-on inquiries if needed. So today we're going to walk through uh, three key data sharing literacies you should know in order to both comply with law and policy and maximize your scholarly impact. So first, um, Anna is going to help us understand how and where to share your research, your share or publish your research data. Then Rachel will guide us on your rights to reuse and republish data that you collect from other sources. And finally, Tim will take us through what you should know about your data. So including whether it's yours and what licensing rights you have um, before you share it online. And I'll close out the session uh, by letting you know where you can get more help and I'll also um, help facilitate the Q&A at the end. I also just quickly wanna state that we're not going to discuss aspects of patenting or commercialization when it comes to data. Um, if you have questions about those sorts of things, we can connect you with APIRA, the Intellectual Property and Industrial Research Alliance's office, um, which is the office that, that handles this aspect of working with data at Berkeley. Um, so I think I'll turn things over to Anna now. Great, thank you, Erin. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, how and um, where we can publish our data. And the first key to data publishing success is really understanding um, these, two, these two items, how and where we're going to do it. And to explore that, we are going to orient data in the knowledge creation life cycle. So I don't always really like life cycles, but I really like this one because I think it gives a very complete picture of the creation process all the way to reuse. Um, so 
Oh, can you go back one slide? There we go. So as researchers, we spend a lot of our time collecting, caring for, and analyzing data. Some of it might be data that we downloaded or compiled from existing databases or websites, um, or it might be another researcher's data set that you acquired. Sometimes it's also data that you might have generated yourself through either observations or interviews, or perhaps you were generating data from a, a lab instrument. Um, the source of our data really affects what we can do with it. But the end goal always is the same in that sharing our data um, is essential to publishing and the knowledge life cycle. So we normally think about going through life cycles in kind of a clockwise direction, beginning with our research project and knowledge creation. But you need to think about where you're starting from when you're using data um, and the various inputs that you'll need. So if we follow this uh, counterclockwise, we can see that before we create new knowledge for the world, um, which is at the top there under creation, we first need to access existing knowledge and content. And I think that's really traditionally been done through um, say a literature review. And that would be more like at 10 o'clock where works are read, cited and recombined. The data must have been preserved uh, further down under preservation by someone or preserved somewhere where you can access it, like through a journal funder or institutional data repository, which is um, at the bottom there with dissemination and access. And it needs to have been made available, available for us, um, ideally reviewed and evaluated, kind of working backwards to evaluation before we can actually use it in our own creation process. The life cycle shown here also underscores the importance of the choices we make when sharing our data. So if we look at, uh, at preservation again at eight o'clock and the, the reading or reuse right above it, um, we may decide to publish our data on our own personal or lab websites. Um, but then what would happen if we change institutions or no longer maintain those sites, say because you've moved on to another project and you become busy and it just kind of falls to the wayside. We disrupt the reading and reuse for other scholars. Um, and that really affects the impact of our own work and others' ability to continue building on that knowledge that we worked so hard to create. Likewise, researchers are a part of this much larger scientific community and the need to build upon what exists in order to continue expanding our knowledge. We do have some role in that community to contribute our own understandings and research outputs to advance science or whatever research field you're in. And one way to do that is by making sure that our research outputs like our data sets are published in a way that allows them to be maximally reused by others. And it's not just enough to put your data out there. You want to share it or license it in a way that both promotes access and reuse. You can also look at data sharing uh, in terms of boosting metrics. Um, data publishing absolutely uh, affects your scholarly impact, impact and that the more you share data or software or code, um, the easier it is for other scholars to work with and cite your contributions. This will drive up citation rates and impact not just for the data that you've published and shared, but also for the articles that you've written on that data. That will feed into your overall impact as an author within your field. And I think that additionally, by sharing our research outputs like data or code, um, we provide a more comprehensive picture of the research. The final published manuscript has always been regarded as kind of the pinnacle of the research effort, but it only communicates one piece. And so by publishing and sharing these other pieces, we have a much more comprehensive understanding of how that data was generated and where we can go from there. So data sharing also increases discovery. Um, perhaps most importantly, by sharing data, you are contributing to the betterment of society by increasing the speed to discovery. 
Our current reality of living in a global pandemic illustrates the outcome of data sharing. And the rapid emergence of three strong vaccine candidates for COVID-19 was absolutely hastened by a public, uh, public private partnership to share protocol and data. So we're living in a data sharing reuse scenario right now. Um, I want to point out just one example of data sharing out of the University of California system. So research, uh, researchers at UC Davis did a study on the efficacy of different types of masks masks used, used under control, um, used to control aerosol particle emission. And this study was published in Nature's Scientific Reports. The authors then deposited their data in Dryad, which is the data repository managed by the University of California. And the data set has been used uh, or has been viewed over 500 times, which you can see in the metrics. When the authors published their data with Dryad, uh, the data set was automatically assigned a license, which you can see off to the side there. And this license tells others what they can do with the work. We're gonna sp spend plenty of time um, later on in this session talking about different license types and why they matter. So there are a few key elements to sharing your data. Um, and there's a great ac acronym that we like to use called making your data fair. So the first is that your data and its accompanying metadata or data about the data are findable with a unique persistent identifier like a DOI. And next, the data need to be accessible, meaning that the user can open files or if need be, go through the proper authorization steps to access the data if they're restricted for any purpose. And I'll talk uh, in a few minutes about the different types of sharing. The data also need to be made interoperable such that users can run their analysis and open the data with the appropriate programs. And finally, the data need to come with adequate descriptors and information such that they can be replicated and properly reused. Part of making data reusable, again, is assigning that appropriate license so that they know exactly how the data can or cannot be reused. So we've talked a little bit about the benefits. Um, I'm now going to talk a little bit about the data sharing spectrum. Sometimes a funder or a publisher requires this with your data, um, but not all ways of sharing data are created equally. So you may choose to share a release data in a variety of ways that affect its ultimate dissemination and impact from least restrictive public access to most restrictive with restricted access. So you could share your data publicly through a publicly accessible repository, which I'll give an example of in just a minute, or you could offer controlled access, making it available to authorized users after a, a certain screening process that they've gone through like a data user sharing agreement or going through a data access committee, something like that. You could also offer collaborative access among scientists or researchers who are of a particular research network. Um, so you could share it through a reasonable request. Or finally, you could really restrict access only to primary researchers such that the data are only available to the research team involved in the data collection process and potentially any institutional partners. So finally, I'm going to talk just a little bit about where we can share our data. So when you're selecting a location to share or publish your data or other research outputs, there are a few things to take into consideration. Your funder might have specific guidelines or recommendations for the repository that they would like you to use. This is especially true if your research is funded by the NIH. If not, there are a few generalist repositories that are freely available for you to use. Dryad, which I mentioned earlier, is supported by the University of California and it's free for you to use. If you're publishing code or uh, would like to archive and publish a repository on GitHub, um, you could use Zenodo, which is run out of CERN. And if you don't know where you would like to publish or you'd like a little bit more guidance, there is a website, re3data.org, which gives some pretty great guidance. 
or you can always, always email the RDM program and we'll help you select the appropriate repository for your data. So now I'm going to pass it off to Rachel, who's going to talk more about how you can reuse or republish someone else's data. Thanks, Anna. Okay, so um, once you've followed Anna's advice and decided to share your data, um, you've got some choices to make if your data is actually content that was provided to you or created by others. So I'm gonna focus on our second key to data publishing success which involves understanding what we can do with data that we've gotten from other researchers, databases, or websites. For this critical decision-making, we've got to understand just two things, copyright and contracts, which are sometimes called licenses. I'll show you what I mean in more concrete terms. What we're allowed to do with other people's data, including whether we're allowed to republish it, affects our own ability to create new knowledge. So take this published article in a Springer Nature journal and the statement about data and code accompanying the article. The article is copyrighted by the publisher. The data and code availability statement in the journal article indicates that the authors put their underlying data in GitHub. And here's the corresponding GitHub page if you're interested where the author's data can be found. Now, the authors may not have realized this, but if all they've done is deposited their data in GitHub, they haven't actually authorized you to do much with it. If we look at GitHub's terms of service, we see that by putting code or data, which is called content on GitHub, anyone can use, display, perform, or reproduce the content, but only on GitHub. So in order to work with someone else's data beyond GitHub, the researchers would have needed to have apply, applied a license to the content, and they didn't. Here is a different example for contrast. Here, the author of this paper has expressly licensed their data as CC BY, which is a Creative Commons attribution, attribution license. So it's immediately clear and obvious what other people are allowed to do with this data. In this case, you're allowed to download, reuse, and republish this researcher's data as long as you cite them. And we're gonna talk more about that later. Alternatively, maybe you've collected your data from research subjects who provided specific authorizations through data use agreements about how your research data could later be used and disseminated. Or maybe you downloaded the content from institutionally licensed databases that have their own terms and conditions or that were licensed under specific terms from other researchers. All of these are examples of contracts that affect and sometimes circumscribe the choices you can make downstream about how you can share your data. And we have to understand them anytime we're getting data from other people. So you might be wondering why worry about or, or bother with any of this as long as I'm citing the data or as long as someone's citing my data. And the answer to that question is that there is an important distinction between attribution and permission. Citing data sets is an essential scholarly practice. When someone's citing your data, they're giving you an attribution. But we need to understand that attribution is separate from the question of whether it's permissible for you to use or republish the data in the first place. Permission or a license is something that you give someone like a gift. When you license your data for reuse or someone has licensed theirs for your reuse, now we've moved into the realm of actually granting permission for certain things to be done with the data. So our main question is, do we always need permission to use other people's data? Can we you know, just attribute it or do we always need to get permission? Well, the answer to that depends on two things, as I mentioned, copyright, and contracts. We have to first consider what copyright law says about what you can do with other people's data, even without getting permission. And second, we have to consider whatever contracts you're bound by that apply a layer of decision-making on top of whatever copyright law might provide. So I'm going to just demystify both copyright and contracts for you. We're gonna start with copyright. In order for us to understand what we can do with other people's data, we first have to have a basic understanding of what copyright is and what its limits are when it comes to data. At its core, 
Copyright is simple. Congress created a collection of statutes to implement a provision of the Constitution. That provision authorized Congress to, quote, promote the progress of science and the useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries, end quote. And they meant science broadly here to include all sorts of scientific, scholarly, and creative endeavors. So basically, the drafters of the Constitution wanted to develop an incentive for artists to create things. We as a society all benefit if people can build on the discoveries that came before, while having an incentive to also create new things. So Congress was authorized to give artists that protection in their creations to incentivize them to create, but also grant rights to others to build on those creations. The way that Congress did this was through granting exclusive rights to authors to control their, the fruits of their creativity, but only for a limited period of time. That's the, the benefit to everyone else. They could get to use things after a certain period of time expired. It's important to be aware of the origins of copyright because we sometimes tend to think of it as a blocker for creative expression and scholarship when actually it was designed to do the opposite. So let's take a quick look at what these exclusive rights actually are. The Copyright Act defines five exclusive rights for creators. Let's say I'm the creator of this map showing species diversity in the Arctic. I have the right, the exclusive right of reproduction, meaning I alone can make copies of this map. Derivative works. I'm the only one who can adapt the map into another format, like edit it and use it in a more detailed diagram. I can distribute it, which means I can pass out copies of the map or publish it online. I can publicly perform it, which performing a map uh, doesn't really make much sense, but you can see how this might be more appropriate for uh, something that was like a book or a script or uh, some music. And I can also publicly display this map, meaning I can put it on display in a public setting. As the copyright holder, I hold these rights exclusively. No one else can do any of those five things. So we said that the carrot and the stick balance with copyright is that the exclusive rights are granted only for a limited period of time in order to incentivize the creation of more works. The duration of copyright can vary, but in the US, it's typically at least 70 years after when the author dies. So the life of the author plus an additional 70 years. What does this mean? It means that within this protected period, you need the copyright owner's permission to do any of those five rights we just talked about. So to recap what we've just gone over, copyright is meant to encourage both the creation and use of creative works by giving authors exclusive rights to do certain things for a limited period of time. So you might be thinking right now, but that limited period of time, at, at least 70 years after an author dies, is really long. How are we ever able to use anyone else's data if the exclusive rights in that data last so long? Well, the boundaries of copyright when it comes to data are fairly limited. First of all, there are some crucial limitations on what copyright covers when it comes to data because not all data is subject to copyright protection to begin with. Copyright only protects expression, not ideas or facts. You cannot copyright a fact, a statistic, or a method. Obviously, you should still be citing your sources if you're doing something like using statistics because you need to conform to best practices for scholarship, but you don't need to ask permission to use them. For example, Here's a simple graph created by a researcher that charts over time the count of unarmed victims of lethal force by police. There is nothing about this graph or the underlying data that is protectable by copyright. Non-expressive data are just facts and a line graph has no original expression. There are only so many ways you can plot the change in police killings as a function of time. There's another important limitation on copyright when it comes to data. And that's because work that's in the public domain 
is not protected by copyright. And there are two types of works that are in the public domain. But I want to be careful here. Just because something is online does not necessarily mean it's in the public domain. Rather, public domain applies specifically to the following two categories. First, US federal government works um, because they're not eligible for copyright protection. This means that you can use something like a data set created by the Environmental Protection Agency without having to get permission to use it. Of course, still cite your sources, but you don't need permission to use it. Now, it's important to understand that public domain status for US government works applies only to federal government works. State government works and foreign government works are treated differently. Not all state government works are protected by copyright, but some can be, and it varies by state. The second category of works in the public domain are works that were originally protected by copyright, but for which the copyright has expired. So take the example here of History of Police in England. It was first published in 1905, and we know that it's in the public domain because copyright has expired. Right now for works published in the US, everything published prior to 1925 is in the public domain. And for more recent works, copyright will expire 70 years after the death of the author. Okay, so let's say the kind of data that you wanna download and use isn't just facts. Let's say it is protected by copyright because it's descriptive, uh, descriptive data like interview notes, or it consists of other people's images or diagrams. As we just saw, this is the kind of data that can be protected by copyright. So does that mean that you necessarily need the copyright holder's permission in order to use and republish it? Not necessarily. Not if the use that you wanna make of the data is a fair use. So we need to understand what a fair use is. Fair use is an exception built into the Copyright Act that Congress included specifically to help and encourage research. Congress wanted to encourage this type of idea exchange. So in section 107 of the Copyright Act, they provided for the following. The fair use of a copyrighted work for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is not an infringement of copyright. Great. So making a fair use for those stated laudatory purposes is not a copyright infringement. But how do we determine whether our use or publication of other people's data qualifies as a fair use? For this, Congress set forth four factors that a court needs to balance in determining whether a use is fair. So we're gonna look at these four factors in the context of data, specifically downloading a copyrighted set of images and text that you're gonna use as your data set. Imagine that your project on police violence is documenting the increased use of explosives or tear gas by police against protesters. And you're collecting text and images from newspapers um, and other sources in order to analyze the prevalence of different types of equipment that the police are using. You plan to both work with the data and also republish it. These are actually two separate fair use decisions you need to make. Factor one of the fair use test looks at the purpose and character of your intended use. Nonprofit educational uses are more likely to be considered fair than commercial uses. But increasingly what a court's going to look to under this factor is whether your use is transformative. That is, are you planning on using the work in a different way or for a different purpose than the original creator? Or alternatively, is what you're doing adding new insights or understandings to the original work? Well, in this case, we don't know exactly what the artist's purpose was in taking this photo, but it might have been to document the mood of the protests. Instead, we're actually using it to analyze the specific equipment that police are using. We're turning this photo into data and thus transforming the intent of, from one of documenting or evoking a feeling to actually adding new insights or understandings about the use of police equipment. Combined with the fact that you're doing that transformative use in a nonprofit educational context means that factor one leans heavily in our favor here. Factor two addresses the nature of the copyrighted work. 
A use is more likely to be fair if you're using a factual or scholarly work rather than a more creative work. But courts hate dealing with this factor because they don't really wanna be in the business of determining how artistic or creative a work is. So factor two is not usually very consequential. But in any case, factor two leans against us here because in fact, this is a creative work. Um, but remember, fair use is a balancing test overall. And any one factor weighing against us is not dispositive of overall fairness. Factor three considers how much of the original work are you using and how important is the portion you're using to the overall work. Despite what you may have heard anecdotally, there is no set percentage that's okay to use, like 10%, that's not a thing, nor is there any set proportion that's too much to use. You could only use a small portion, but if it's the most crucial portion that could weigh against fair use, and in other cases, you may need to use the entire thing and that won't weigh against fair use because you actually need the whole thing to make your point. What's important instead is using an amount of the work that's narrowly tailored to your new purpose. So in our case, with the data that we're collecting, we might need to download or reproduce all of these photos in order to assess what equipment the police are using. But when it comes to the fair use decision about what we need to republish of the data we're collecting, we actually don't need to use the parts of this photo outside of the equipment on the police officers. Technically, we don't need all of the ground or the fog or atmosphere or anything else. So for our republishing decision, we could consider cropping the photo down to include just the parts we need, and that would be make it the best fit for fair use under this factor. Finally, factor four looks at whether your use would supplant the market for the original. Meaning, would someone in your shoes otherwise purchase or license the work before downloading or republishing it? If there's no ready licensing market for the photo and we're just using a low res photo that isn't going to supplant licenses for the high quality original anyway, in other words, someone would still need to license from the rights holder if they wanted to get a nice version of the photo, then we're not supplanting the market for the original. And so once again, factor four weighs in our favor. So to recap, we're overall strong on factors one and four and moderate on factor three. So our use of, of this photo um, for downloading all of these photos to extract data from them about the use of police equipment will likely be a fair use. But we may need to make some different choices about whether we can republish all of these photos um, and put them in a repository. As I mentioned, we'd likely wanna crop out everything but the equipment to be stronger on factor three for fair use. In any case, you can see the difference um, in what the result would be if we were really going to transform understanding of these photos under factor one. The more we transform, the stronger factor one is, and the stronger our fair use argument is overall. No matter what, it's always uh, going to be a balancing test. There's no bright line, there's no formula you can apply. But keep in mind that the fair use exception is purposefully broad and flexible to promote academic freedom, expression, education, and debate. Next slide. So remember I said that our key to step two um, for republishing data is sorting out copyright and understanding contracts. We need to think about what agreements we might be bound by. You may have entered into data use agreements with other researchers or the subjects of your research. It could also be the case that the databases available through the library have restrictions on what you can do with the data you download from them. And if you're getting data from a website, that site's terms of use might govern what you can do and how you can obtain or, or share that data going forward. So let's take a look at these. We don't have time to go through examples of every kind of agreement, but I just wanna show you a sample illustrating what I mean about contracts controlling what you can do separate from whatever copyright might exist in the data or content. So even if this data is not protected by copyright, because let's say it's just facts, there could still be a contract telling you what you are or are not allowed to do. 
So here's the first example. Let's say you are downloading content from a, a library database. In this case, the database of journal articles covered by the American Institute of Physics. Well, the library has signed an agreement with the American Institute of Physics that covers both your ability to collect or download the data and your ability to republish that data. And the agreement we signed says that while you can share your findings or research results in a way that doesn't compete with the database, you cannot share or republish the data set itself. That is the content you downloaded. Meaning if someone wants to run different tests on the data set you downloaded, you cannot make that data set available to them because of the terms of our agreement. Even if you think it would have been a fair use to do so, the contract circumscribes that through this provision. So at most, what you could do is give them a list of all of the items you downloaded, and if they have access to them through their own institutions, they could go to those URLs and download them under their own institutional agreement. Now, this could be a problem if your funder wants you to publish your data set. You need to be clear that what you could publish with an agreement like this is only a list of the URLs to, linking to the items included in the data set, but not the data itself. Here's a different example, this time not of a database that you're getting data from, but instead a website you're using to download content or data. In this case, PubMed Central is a public access repository that contains a lot of federally funded research that was created via grants from the National Institutes of Health. If you're downloading data associated with research articles in PubMed Central, or you are text finding the articles in PubMed Central, and then you wanna share both the results and analysis and the original set of articles that you worked with, which constitutes your data, you've got to look at what PubMed Central's website terms of use say. And under their terms of use, they expressly prohibit bulk downloading of articles because article authors or publishers hold copyright in them. Um, now, we know that under copyright law, downloading articles to conduct research would be fair use, as we just took a look at. But PubMed Central has now applied a layer of contract on top of that, telling you that you, you can't. You can't bulk download these articles, much less republish them as a corpus or data set. So the main point here is just that just because data is online doesn't mean you have permission to do what you want with it. The terms of use for that online content may control what you can do both in terms of downloading and later republishing, even if it would have been fair use to do both or even if that data isn't protected by copyright to begin with. So let's put what we just learned for, for key factor number two into helpful takeaways. What we just talked about can be distilled into four key tips for navigating copyright and contracts when it comes to using other people's data. First, remember that copyright imposes no restrictions on the sharing of the basic building blocks of knowledge, facts and ideas, which are part of the public domain. Raw observational and experimental data are facts for purposes of copyright, meaning they are free to be shared and reused without copyright restrictions. Computer programs are copyrightable only to the extent that they incorporate the programmer's expression of original ideas as distinguished from the ideas themselves. Typically, you'll encounter copyrightable data usually only when that data contains descriptive elements or if it's qualitative data, such as interview observations, notes, quotes, drawings, things like that. Annotations, visualizations, and other forms of metadata can also receive separate copyright protection if they are sufficiently original. So for example, creating visualizations, figures, charts, and graphs could be protectable by copyright if there's enough expression in it. Second, bear in mind that there can be layers of copyright protection for data sets. You might, have, um, you might have a set of data that in itself is not protectable by copyright, except it might be protectable only as to the way in which the data is selected, arranged, or organized. For example, even the organization of an Excel spreadsheet could be copyrightable if a researcher exercised discretion in selecting field names and arranging their order. However, whatever copyright exists in that Excel spreadsheet 
would arise only around this aspect of organization. Another researcher would not be infringing any of the rights associated with this work if they were to republish the data within the spreadsheet um, and then just renamed or reorganized the fields. Third, even if your data is protected by copyright or someone else's data is protected by copyright, you should consider whether the way you want to use or publish their data constitutes fair use. The fair use decision about whether it's okay for you to download, that is reproduce their data, is separate from the fair use decision you'll need to make about whether you can republish that data by putting it in a repository. The former, the downloading for research, is very likely to be fair use. The latter, which is the republishing in a repository of other people's data, is often less likely to be fair use without modifications to that person's data or without getting permission to use it. Which brings us to our fourth point. Copyright aside, often the most important thing when it comes to publishing data that you've gotten from third parties is whether there are agreements or licenses that control what you can do. You need to take stock of whether there are contractual restrictions that apply, regardless of whether the underlying data is copyrightable. These can be in the form of data use agreements, library license databases, or website terms of service. If you're not sure whether there's an agreement you need to abide by, just contact us and we'll be happy to help you explore it. Also keep in mind that perhaps the copyright holder has already applied a license, like a Creative Commons license to the data, which already gives you permission to do what you hope to do with it. So Rachel told us about the copyright and contracts affecting our ability to work with and republish other people's data. And the final key to data publishing success is how law and policy affect what your own rights are um, to the data that you're creating and what choices you make as you prepare to publish that data. So you spent so much time working with and analyzing the data that you've collected, but you may be surprised to learn that in some cases, it's not actually yours. And this affects both what you can publish and also the terms and conditions you can apply to it. So what do I mean by sometimes the data is not actually yours? Well, from a legal perspective, your ownership rights over the data depends on a few different things. First, your employment status. Second is the policy at the institution where you're employed. And third, any agreements that you've signed with funders. And we'll talk about each of these. So first, let's have a look at employment status and how this affects what you can do with data. Now, let's presume for the moment that your data is actually copyrightable. Remember, not all data can be protected by copyright if it's just simple facts. But let's say you've got data with original expression in it. Now, as we've learned earlier, normally the person who actually creates a work gets copyright in it. But there are some exceptions to this such as what are known as works made for hire. So what do we mean? Well, in this situation, the employer is treated as the author for copyright purposes. One of the primary ways this occurs is when a work is created by an employee as a part of the employee's regular duties. So let's say you work as a data analyst for Google and part of your job is conducting user surveys processing data and publishing the results. Even though you could be creating copyrightable data, Google will most likely be the copyright owner in that data and not you, since you are creating this material as a part of your regular job responsibilities. So with the knowledge of authorship in relation to uh, works made for hire, Let's take a closer look at how this applies to you as a member of the university. So the UC has various policies relating to copyright ownership, um, also the ownership of course materials and policies related to how data can be shared. So faculty remain the copyright holders in the scholarly works that they create. 
even if they are technically employed by the university. So this means that if a faculty member conducts independent research and publishes an academic paper based on it, they keep the copyright in that paper. This also applies to most of the course materials that faculty create as academic and instructional appointees. If you are a registered student at the UC, you generally own the copyright in the works you create, including theses and dissertations. But the situation for UC employees such as staff and students employed at the university is that works created by these groups will be considered works made for hire. So the copyright typically rests with the university here. So for example, say you're employed as a development specialist for the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. Part of your job is creating an annual fundraising report that is then published on the Goldman School website. This type of institutional work would most likely be created within the scope of your university employment. Thus, the copyright holder would be the UC, not you as an individual. So how does all of this play out for research data that you generate while employed for the UC? Now, the university's policy on sharing research data is a bit different than the copyright ownership policy and the course materials policy. Uh, it's covered by what's called APM 20. This is part of the academic personnel manual. And a section within this document talks about the sharing of research results created at the university. And since it covers academic personnel, it means we're mostly talking about faculty here. And it says that notebooks and other original records of the research are the property of the university and that the university may itself publish the material or may authorize a member of the faculty to publish it through some recognized scientific or professional medium of publication. Now, this policy was adopted in 1958. And as you can see, it's the opposite of how the university deals with copyright in scholarly works. And this text could create a lot of problems because faculty think they own the data when technically they don't if it's an original notebook. And the University of California is in the process of updating this data policy. But finally, sometimes there are terms and conditions within government or philanthropic grants that dictate how the outputs of that grant must be handled. And many funders now require that you make data available and specify the specific terms under which it is being shared. For example, the National Institutes of Health adopted a policy for data management and sharing, which says that recipients of NIH funding should attempt to make scientific data that arises from that funding accessible as soon as possible, or at least at the time that their scientific papers are published. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation requires that data underlying the published research result be immediately accessible and open under a Creative Commons attribution license. So say a faculty member gets a grant from the Gates Foundation conducts research and publishes a scientific paper based on that funding. They retain the copyright in the work, but the terms of the grant also says that the research article and the underlying data must be shared under an open license. Another thing to mention here are embargoes. Some research funding institutions or universities or publishers impose time embargoes for the access to and the reuse of scientific data produced during the course of that research. And these restrictions can be based on either a formal contract or instituted via a policy. And sometimes the embargoes differ based on the norms of a particular research discipline or research community. Now, so far we've focused mostly on the copyright and contractual aspects of using other people's data um, and also your rights as a creator of data. 
but there are a few other law and policy considerations that you should think about too. And these include privacy and also ethical considerations. And I'll talk about each of these next. So today we're just going to touch on a few of the key takeaways about privacy law. Um, if you're interested, we have a whole set of videos that explores privacy in much greater detail. Now, whereas copyright law protects the rights holders' interests in their works, privacy rights protects the interests of people who are the subjects of those works. Privacy rights arise most often if you are seeking to use third party primary source content, content like correspondence and diaries, but also things like oral histories or pictures of particular people. And there are a number of federal statutes that protect against the disclosure of various types of personal information. For example, we have FERPA, which covers student information and HIPAA, which covers health information. There are also state laws governing privacy that make certain types of intrusions a wrongful act. We're not gonna spend time today going into details about these. Instead, we want to make sure you're aware of important limitations on privacy rights that can support your use of other people's data sets and also some things to consider when you're publishing your own data. First thing is that privacy rights expire at death, meaning you can't be liable for disclosing private facts about a person who's dead. Second, if the individual is not identifiable from the information or image you're providing, then there's no state law privacy violation. Third, if the material you wish to include reveals private facts that are newsworthy, then it could be okay to use them. Newsworthiness means it's of public interest or concern, which your data project may very well be. And then a final limitation is when the person who is the subject of the information has given you permission to publish it. And if this is the case, then an invasion of privacy claims should not be sustainable. So say you're a researcher who gets a data set from a public record filing on police misconduct such as a court record that shows charges and convictions. And you want to use and republish this data set. So from a privacy perspective, if the data is from public record filings, the entity that filed it should have done a privacy screening. However, sometimes private data is not properly filed. And if that's the case, then you shouldn't republish it. For instance, Sometimes you can see health records or protected financial information that should have been redacted or filed under seal, and you could still violate privacy statutes by republishing it. But one way we can mitigate this is by screening for inappropriately filed personal information. Things like social security numbers, uh, health or mental health conditions, um, or financial information. Now, if you do find any, you should decide whether to exclude that record, redact certain personal information, or keep it as is depending on your comfort level and risk tolerance. But barring the inclusion of health, financial, social security numbers, we really don't have a privacy concern here. These types of public documents fit into the relevant exceptions to state privacy torts. They are of public interest and they're newsworthy. And further, they concern public figures and police as opposed to private citizens. Finally, uh, we'll take a look at ethics and data sharing and publishing. So imagine for a moment you're creating a project that contains data that could be harmful to people. And while newsworthiness may be an exception to privacy law, you may still face ethical considerations. Let's again look at the police misconduct data set to review whether there are any ethical considerations in using and resharing it. Now, there's likely no copyright, privacy, or contractual restrictions on rehosting the publicly filed court documents. 
But the main issue here is one of ethics. And ethics is not a legal issue, but we need to consider it in the course of conducting research and data publishing. And some archives have decided not to collect or not to digitize criminal trial court records because they're uncomfortable with the idea that they might only have, say, charging documents, but not follow on materials. For example, if the charges were later dropped or if the person was eventually acquitted. And similarly, with the police misconduct records, whatever we view in the docket right now might not tell the whole story. There might be other data that is not included, such as whether a particular case was dropped or settled. Now, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to ethics and the digitization or publication of data, even though there are disciplinary norms and other recommendations. You should check to see what's considered good practices within your specific field. Here's another approach you could also consider. What the UC Berkeley Library has adopted locally when we make decisions about what to put online are a set of balancing considerations. And at their core, they look at whether the value to researchers, to the public, or to cultural communities outweighs the potential for harm or exploitation of people, resources, or knowledge. Now, this balancing framework is just a suggestion. And for your individual projects, you could consider whatever values you want to uphold, as well as any relevant community and disciplinary standards as you're developing and publishing your data projects. And it's a good idea to make these choices clear to your viewers and contributors. Let them know about the ethical considerations in how they are using and repurposing the data especially considering that it could be combined and displayed in ways that the original authors might not have intended. So now that we understand the copyright, contractual, privacy, and ethical considerations in using and sharing data, we can turn to the last step in the process, choosing and applying a license to your own data outputs. Licensing matters because it's how you grant the public permission to use copyrights associated with a database or data set that you've created. But before we do this, let's think back to remind ourselves what copyright covers. Copyright protects original expression fixed in a tangible medium. It doesn't protect ideas or facts. So why does this matter? Well, Let's say you're a researcher and you want to post to the web a complex data set that has an original database model. If someone else wanted to copy the data set merely to extract the data elements, they wouldn't even need permission to do this because the elements are not copyrightable because facts and statistics can't be protected. However, if a reuser wants to republish your entire data set, they would be implicating the copyright layer in a manner that would require a license because your database model is original and copyrightable. So how do we balance promoting progress of science while at the same time protecting copyright? One way to do this as a researcher is to apply an open license to your research outputs, including your data sets. Standardized licenses such as those offered by Creative Commons permit you as the creator to keep your copyright, but grant broad permissions to others to reuse your research data within their own work. These types of open licenses ensure that others who use and republish your data model give you credit as the author. Now, the primary Creative Commons legal tools are six flavors of copyright licenses. In addition to a copyright waiver that allows you to put your work directly into the public domain. And for data sharing, two of these are most relevant. First, we have what's called CC0. This is a tool that enables creators to waive any copyright in their work thereby placing them as completely as possible into the public domain. 
when they do so, this means that anyone can freely build upon, enhance, and reuse the works for any purpose without restriction. Then there is the Creative Commons Attribution License, uh, usually shortened to CC BY. It's a permissive copyright license that lets others distribute, remix, and build upon your work, even commercially, as long as they credit you for the original creation. And CC BY is the broadest of all the Creative Commons licenses. Now, there are other open licensing options available, including those produced by the Open Data Commons, the Open Source Initiative, and the Free Software Foundation. Uh, many of these are more used for software than data specifically. So which license should you choose? Well, keep in mind that you want to be able to facilitate reuse and also avoid any confusion by others by clearly communicating the terms under which you're sharing your own data. And one important thing is that you don't want to add license restrictions where none should exist. So say you've conducted a quantitative survey and the results are just simple factual data. And even though it might be attractive to attach a Creative Commons attribution license to the data set, we've learned that facts cannot be copyrighted. They're in the public domain. Thus, your data shouldn't be licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. It would be more appropriate to use the CC0 waiver because it removes all ambiguity and confirms to the world that you've placed the data set into the public domain. And don't worry, even if you won't be able to require attribution on your data set via the CC license, the norms of academic scholarship can still go a long way to ensuring that you get the credit for the data set because downstream users must properly cite where they got it from. Also, remember that some funder policies might stipulate a particular license under which the data from the grant needs to be made available. Now, websites such as the Creative Commons License Chooser or chooseolicense.com can walk you through which license is most appropriate for your particular needs. Another thing to keep in mind is that sometimes repositories have policies around which types of licenses they allow on their websites. So for example, Anna mentioned Dryad, which uses, which is the UC's data repository. And Dryad requires that all files must be submitted using the CC0 public domain dedication, the waiver that we were talking about. Now, again, this means that the user is waiving their copyright in the data set, thus putting it into the public domain for broad reuse by everyone else. And other repositories might permit more licensing options, but this is what Dryad has chosen. Now, if the data is entirely yours, this is a great result because we avoid the ambiguity problem I just mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, what other people can do with your data is, is clear. But think about things from the other direction too. If you intend to deposit other people's copyrighted data included within your data set, well, now you're about to put a CC0 public domain dedication on the entire thing. And that's opening up their data in a way they didn't intend. So you may need to put a note in your deposit metadata that everything is CC0 except for the third party content, which remains protected by copyright. So I'm gonna throw it back to Aaron and I think we'll have time for questions and answers now. Great, thanks Tim. Um, and thanks Rachel and Anna. So before I stop recording, um, I just want to uh, let everyone know that you're more than welcome to obviously ask questions now, um, but this is the contact information for both uh, the Office of Scholarly Communication Services and the Research Data Management Program. Um, that you can feel free to re reach out to either or both at any time uh, if you have further questions on this or other things related to copyright licensing or research data management more broadly. So let me stop the recording.